I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this, and he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. When you're yelling at an employee to do something, you are losing, right? That is a bad situation. You're much better off if you're asking questions rather than telling people what to do. Because if you ask somebody a question, they're then engaged in your thought process. They're going to try to figure out why you asked the question and they'll modify their behavior. And did you ever find yourself during these 18 years at Google yelling at someone and thinking in your head, "Ugh, Bill is not going to like this, but I feel like I have to do it. I, I made that mistake and many, many others. And the story there actually shows you how sort of foolish I was. John Doerr, who had recruited me to the company, calls and says, you need a coach. And I said, I don't need a coach. Look at all the things that I've done. Look how good I am. You know, compared to everyone else, I mean, come on, you just hired me. I'm like super good. <laughs> right? And I more or less said it like that, like super arrogant. And John listened to me and then he said, um, do tennis players have coaches? Hmm. He had gotten me with that question. And of course, tennis players have coaches. And I pointed out that the coaches were not as good as the tennis players. And John said, that's the point, right? A coach does something different. Hmm. So I'm here with... Uh, sorry, can, can you use the mic? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> you would think I would know. So I'm here with Eric Schmidt. You might know him. He was the CEO for a few years of a tiny little software search engine, I guess, Google. And uh, now he's an author. He's been author, author of three books, but uh, this latest one is called Trillion Dollar Coach, the leadership playbook of Silicon Valley's Bill Campbell, who, as he'll describe, uh, was the coach for many uh, well-known CEOs, including you, Eric, including Steve Jobs. He's, he's advised Amazon. I think you, talk, you talked to 80 different people to, for the research of this book. And the reason he's a trillion dollar coach is if you add up the value of the companies he coached and, and presumably the value he created, it amounts to the trillions of dollars. I think it's at least two trillion. And thank you for having me on your show. Uh, thank book, you for coming. This is, this well, is a, it's a great... Big, it's, uh, it's a big deal for me to be here and, and indeed in the comedy club as well. Um, <laughs> so I did this book with Jonathan Rosenberg and Alan Eagle, and we were the co-authors of How Google Works a few years ago earlier. And Bill was our coach, mentor, friend, and he died three years ago after a long battle with cancer. He would never have approved of this book. 
Well, he, he, you, you mentioned in the book, and, and it's kind of clear in the book, he's really behind the scenes on everything. And, and one of his principles that, that it, that's brought up over and over is give credit. And that's what he does. He never, he's never going around saying, oh, I'm the guy who advised Eric Schmidt to stay at Google or Steve Jobs to do this. He, he never would say anything like that. He always refused. And as his reputation built, people wanted to interview him. He did one interview with Fortune with a, a writer who he liked personally named Adam Lashinsky. The interview was so perfect and so wonderful that he hated it. And he said he would never do one again. What, right? what does he, that mean? What, what, he didn't like that he, it was he, perfect? He was, he was so uncomfortable with the attention. And that was a statement of his humility and also the fact that he was focused on others. And the most interesting thing to me about Bill is he is a life's lesson for executives. Right? There is an age when it's time for you to get off the stage. And in his case, he chose to get off the stage, he'd been very successful up to a certain point, and help others for no compensation. His theory was it was give back. Right? That's how he would help. He had been, life had been so good to him, he wanted to give back to the industry and to the people he cared about. Well, you know, a couple of things there. One is, first, just to mention on Bill Campbell's background, he was the CEO of Intuit, a major software company. He was the CEO of uh, Go. Go. Uh, he was a CEO of Claris, which was a software company that spun out of Apple, and he was a, a, a big executive at Apple well, way and, back. And I can, let me add that if you're familiar with the 1984 Apple ad, the one about the, that ran at the Super Bowl, uh, he was the vice president of marketing who did that ad. And so he, his, he contribution, his contribution his, to our history is phenomenal, but nobody knows this. Yeah, and and the, the board, if I remember correctly in the, book, in the book, the board of Apple was against releasing that ad. They were even thinking of, can we sell the ad time that we had purchased on the Super Bowl? And somebody, I guess, working for Bill found a buyer for that ad time, and Bill was like, don't, don't tell anyone, we're, we're running this ad. So he was really the decision maker that ran that ad. And it was a little bit of internal combat, but he and Scott, he and Steve sort of had the brilliance of understanding that they could do what turns out to be the most iconic ad, you know, in the last 20 or 30 years. That's a pretty big deal. And yet, at some point, he gets off the stage and he becomes the coach for Steve Jobs, myself, and others. Another interesting thing about Bill is that you know Apple had two Steve had two lives at Apple his first period and then he left for roughly 4 years to do next and then he went back to run Apple the first board member he brought in was Bill Campbell and Apple's rise today from at the time it was worth 2 roughly 2 billion dollars to almost to almost a trillion dollars was directly correlated with Bill being on the board and working with Steve especially when Steve got sick so the other thing i want to mention related to what you just said about getting off the stage and then uh, not accepting compensation for all of his many efforts. Uh, you know, the, towards the end of the book, you mentioned um, a quote that Bill gave to Ron Johnson as he was leaving as CEO of JCPenney, uh, you know, about what to do next with his life. And Bill's quote was, which I thought was very beautiful, was, if you've been blessed, be a blessing. And I think that's how he chose to live his life, uh, particularly in those later years when he moved into coaching and mentoring. And just, just real quickly, how do you see, and then I kind of want to get into your background and relationship with Bill and, and how that unravels in the book or you know, unveil, unveils itself in the book. But uh, you know, for, for, for Bill, what, what, what do you think is the difference between coaching and mentoring? Well, a lot of people are confused about this because everybody wants a mentor. You want somebody to complain to, you want to support you, to feel better. We need this. That's not what a coach is. A coach is somebody who is helping the team win. And what's interesting about it, when my case, when I had a coach, I thought he was coaching me as an individual. In researching this book, I realized that he had been coaching the company and the whole team the whole time. Right? His interactions with me were so personal that I felt he was an individual coach. But what he was really doing was making sure we were all fighting for the same principle for the institution that we're part of. And that was what he did as a coach. And no business today has a coach like that. And it's a terrible omission. You know, and, and I, he has so many interesting principles and stories that you talk about throughout the book. But I want to kind of at least demonstrate some of them first through example. The first example being 
you. So uh, first, by, by way of background, you know, you were, you were CEO of Novell, you, you had a, a huge uh, career in the tech industry, and Google was a relatively small but fast-growing company in 2001, and you know, Larry Page, Sergey Brin, they, they felt the need, I guess, or they were being encouraged to bring on a uh, more mature CEO to help them through the IPO process and through the growth process and so on. Do you think, A, they resented that, and B, what was maybe kind of any initial concerns when you all three started working together, when you became the CEO and you started working together? And this will lead to, to Bill's involvement with you staying at Google. So Larry and Sergey had taken money from the venture capitalists, as one does, and part of the deal was that they had to bring in somebody who had some operating experience. So Larry and Sergey, being clever and unusual, decided to test every one of them out. So they would typically go on a weekend vacation with every candidate, which usually would not end well. well they, like, like when did it not end well? Well, let's just say they did not have compatible views. Uh, can, can, yeah, you can't, you can't leave me with that. <laughs> What's an example? Um, it's better not to name names, but let's just say that the culture of tech, tech is different, and you need people who can operate the way they operate, which is largely technical, with a technical background and a lot of experience, and I had that. Do you think Steve Jobs made the mistake of you know, not bringing someone from a technology background when he brought in John Scully as CEO? Well, it's interesting that, that I don't know that, but what I do know is that when I joined Google, um, I wanted to avoid the John Scully, Steve Jobs mistake. For those of you who don't know, what happened was that after the first stint, it was agreed that they should bring in a professional executive because Steve was pretty crazy in, a, in, a crazy in an entrepreneurial way. So they brought in a very seasoned executive named John Scully. The two had a fight, and John went to the board and said, pick Steve or pick me. And the board picked the CEO whom they had just hired, and Steve lost his job of his company. Four years later, of course, John was out, another set of CEOs went in and out, and then Steve came back. And I knew right up front that it was important to avoid that fate. So I set out to work with Larry and Sergey, who I admired and enjoyed a great deal, but it, it's, I understood it was their company, and I was there to help, and that's how we got it. Well, well, and I don't know if Bill learned this from you or vice versa, but uh, in the book you mentioned when um, you know, there was a new chairman of Twitter. He, or no, when he, when there was a new CEO of Twitter, Dick Costello, uh, he gave the advice that listen, the founders are always the founders. You're the CEO right now, so make sure it, you know you get along. You 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 work with the founders well, and I think that avoids the whole. I think Bill and I just sort of agreed on that. I think neither of us learned that from the other. It was obvious, given what had happened with Scully. Uh, that it was important to respect the founders. And indeed, if you look at the most successful technology companies today, the founder has been incredibly involved in their success. And the reason is that the founders can do things that no one else, they have both the intellectual power, the emotional power, in some cases, the ownership to actually force change at a time of great challenge in a corporation. Uh, we're, we collectively, and I in particular, am very much supporter of founder-led companies. So were, I was there to help. Right. So from 2001 to 2004, was this, were, these were these pre-IPO years. So also, there was an internet bust going on for, for the first part of that, where you arrive at Google, operationally, you're, you're gearing the company up for huge growth, which maybe they could have done, maybe they couldn't have, or maybe they weren't interested in doing. Were there any... It, it, it was before. This was sort of a pre-Bill time for you at Google. Well, what, actually, actually, Bill came in in the first in the at the end of two thousand one. So he was there part of the pre-IPO period as well. And the story there is actually sort of um, shows you how sort of foolish I was. John Doerr, who had recruited me to the company, remember I'm aware of my need to work well with Larry and Sergey, calls and says, "You need a coach." And I said, "I don't need a coach." Look at all the things I've done. Look how good I am. You know, compared to everyone else, I mean, come on, you just hired me. I'm like super good. <laughs> right? And I more or less said it like that. And the, pretty arrogant. Maybe like super arrogant. And, and John listened to me and then he said, um, do tennis players have coaches? Hmm. He had gotten me with that question. 
And of course, tennis players have coaches. And I pointed out that the coaches were not as good as the tennis players. And John said, that's the point, right? A coach does something different. Hmm. So based on that, uh, we started with Bill, who I knew well socially from because the Valley is small. And he was immediately correct. And so he started off working with our product marketing function, which consisted of three product managers, right? Who are Susan Wojcicki, Marissa Mayer, and Salar Kemengar, who went on to have enormously successful careers in building out product management and then sales and working with our board. And so uh, during this time, so, so in 2004, I guess, with, with, with the IPO happening, there was this critical coaching that Bill did with you that, that kept you at the company. And we'll get to that in a second. But before then, were there any moments, again, it's you coming in to this culture, to what Larry and Sergey had built, were there any moments of, of tension or even small problems that needed to be worked out where Bill was critical at kind of seeing uh, the gaps between, in communication between the three of you? And you refer to uh, that he was so good at understanding these small gaps in communication later on. I'm just curious where it might have happened with you personally. Um, well, it happened all the time in that he would meet with everybody. Um, we started not focused with Larry and Sergey because I was very focused on that relationship, but on the, getting the board set up. Because in these small dynamic companies, there's an awful lot going on. So his first duty was to do the board. And I said, well, Bill, why don't you get on the board? And he said, I would never want to be on the board. And I said, why? I mean, you know, it's a big, big deal to be on our board. And he said, it would prevent me from doing what I want to do. Very interesting. So, so he really understood that, you know, and this is related to the compensation issue as well, that to avoid all, to really do the best job as a coach, which is what he was fundamentally interested in and what, what was providing meaning for him, it seems, in his life, as opposed to money or titles or, you know, being famous or whatever, to really do what he wanted to do, he needed no conflicts at all. He needed to be able to call you and Tell you off without being worried Absolutely. about kicking, getting and, kicked and, off the board. And one of the things that he that he that he worked very hard on was trust. Um, <clears throat> one of our executives had gotten ill with a cancer that was similar to what Bill was facing, um, and Bill didn't tell me. And I remember being both annoyed that he didn't tell me I was the CEO, but also impressed that he could keep a secret. Right. So you judge people based on on trust pretty quickly. You know, can you trust somebody or not? And I quickly determined that I could trust him. And I think one of the things that's never talked about is that all of the people in these critical situations have all sorts of personal choices and ambiguities and so forth. And he got to the point where he was giving everyone advice, but his entire goal was to keep the team together, just like a football coach. Yeah, he, he, throughout the book, you focus on, and he focuses on the importance of the team. And not at the complete sacrifice of the individual, because I think he encouraged individual development. He encouraged managers themselves to be coaches to the people working for them so that the people working for them could live their best lives and have their best potential. But there was always this focus that the employ the member of a team needs to focus on the bigger vision while being optimal from an operational point so, of view. And, and one of the things that, again, I think this is true in general and in the industry that you're from as well, is that there are superstar people and they really are better th at what they're doing than other people. And you have to figure out a way to keep them in the company employed and focused. Often these superstar people come with baggage, starting with arrogance like I exhibited or narcissism or self-doubt in strange ways. And so the coaching around superstars, which, and I think about, think about a football coach today with all these superstars, with all the money they have, or a basketball coach, you can see the metaphor, right? They actually need to understand what makes these people tick. So what I learned about Bill was that he would first ingratiate himself in the sense that he would tell you you were good at something. And then when you inevitably failed at it, he would say, you can do better. Now, why doesn't he say, you suck to start with. And the answer is he understood that the criticism wasn't to criticize you, but rather to have you criticize yourself. And you made yourself better. And that to me is the essence of coaching. So if I had to say to you, um, you didn't ask very good questions today, <laughs> right? Well, highly likely. Well, and your questions are fantastic. <laughs> you would say, oh, you know, what does Eric know? He's not that good and so forth. You would dismiss me. But if I had a long-standing relationship with you and I said, you know, you're the best interviewer I've ever worked with, except now, 
right? All of a sudden, my credit, which is not the case, by the way, but what would happen is you would say, oh my God, what did I do wrong today? You wouldn't reject my criticism, but if I did a direct attack on you, right, you would. So this, the coaching has, a, it's a way of getting in and getting inspiration and getting people to be better. Well, so that's- And that's, this is never taught. But that's an interesting distinction. So as opposed, like people always talk about a coach often can give constructive advice, but what you're saying is actually a little different, which is the coach in this case is forcing you to be curious about yourself versus right. giving advice. So he's going to ask the questions to make you curious about yourself. So, so, so I'll, I'll give an example that he did with you or started to do with you. So in 2004, um, the company's going public. Uh, I believe it was John Doerr or the board asked you to, uh, step down as chairman, but remain a CEO, just to kind of remove, there's a common in companies to remove the conflict. You bristled at this. You, you were like, I haven't done a bad job. Why should I yeah. change my roles? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And, and you called Bill, you spoke to him about it. And, and at least the first question Bill asks you in the book is, you know, when are you planning on, you were going to quit as CEO because of this. That's how angry you were. Well, I, I want to be honest and say it hurt my pride, right? I had been doing a good job, right? And remember, I have an ego, right? I'm, I, I consider myself good at this. Why would this be done to me, right? And so in my mind, which is insane today, I decided that I would just quit. It had hurt my feelings. And Bill looked at me and said, that is the stupidest thing ever. Well, he didn't say that at first. Yeah. He, he, said, he said, when are you planning on doing this first? That's right. And I, and I think it's interesting that he didn't argue with you at first, but was asking you questions to learn more about what was going on. And he delved into my feelings, which is obviously just, just an emotional reaction. And the important thing is he said, I, I can fix this. And my trust of him was so great by that point that I didn't have him write down a plan. You know, normally I would say, well, prove it. But in Bill's case, I, I just believed him. I believed that he had the emotional power and the constructive power to address whatever this ill was right, that was bothering me, and I calmed down. Now think about what a disaster that would have been for me had I followed through on my terrible judgment. But listening to Bill, that's, and that's when the coach matters. Another comment about business is it's easy to run a business which is booming where everything's going well. But when the tough time come, that's when you learn if you have great leadership. And so he, he said to you, let me, I'm going to fix this, which didn't necessarily mean, he didn't say to you, I'm going to get you what you want. That's correct. He, <laughs> he did said, not say, he did not give me a specific objective and he did not give me a specific time frame. He said, I can get this fixed. So, so what ended up happening was you did step down as chairman. So, and three years later in 2007, you, you were reinstated as chairman, but you had that trust and he did roughly fix it or you trusted that that was and a the fix. solution was the solution was an excellent solution so my point is that's an example of the back the back and forth that happens um jonathan rosenberg is here jonathan has a quote from tom landry that he uses oh. jonathan where are you do you remember the quote about coaching well i will now <laughs> um, a coach can hear the things that you can't hear and see the things that you don't want to see so he can help you become the person you always wanted to be. And so how do you think, for, for both of you, how do you think Bill developed such high, uh, let's call it emotional intelligence to be able to, to see that in people and then bring it out in people? Because I think to develop that, you kind of have to go through your own set of horror stories and ego and pride and so on to kind of develop that skill set to recognize it in others. Well, I think first his talent had broken out early. He was an okay coach. He wasn't a great coach, but he was an okay coach in his 20s. So he had some experience with coaching. Uh, an actual football team, an coach actual, Columbia's actual, football team. I, 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 yes, a, a, a football team, if you will, at Columbia. And the important point, and he wasn't particularly excellent at the football side, but he was clearly a very, very good coach. So I think he did have a native skill, but he took a set of principles to his coaching. He was present. When you talk to him, he was talking directly to you. He wasn't distracted. You, you got into his head and he got into your head and he, he understood you. He asked how things were. I don't know about you all, but I'm so busy, I don't have time to say, 
how's your kids, how's your family, you know, so forth. I mean, like we get back to work, right? And that's wrong. What Bill taught is spend a few minutes, how's the kids, how's your family, how's your health, what are you doing, what are your aspirations? It doesn't take much, but that extra little time makes a huge difference. Did you find, uh, you know, and again, experiencing this from, from Bill, did you find that you started doing this with your employees or your direct reports? Um, I think not well enough. And I'd say I would criticize myself today is I'm still too much to the answer and too much on policy. There's lots of evidence that outcomes in human systems are largely determined by affection, love, bonds, networks, friends, and so forth. And that policy that is programmatic, the kind of things that intellectuals talk about, is less important than the human links, what happens in your family, in your life, in your friends, and the people you work with that drives the outcome. You know, there was, there was also, in, in terms of the, the team aspect, there's one, um, there's one story, the story where Bill meets Sheryl Sandberg, who had kind of this uh, sort of ambiguous title at the time when she started at, at Google. It was like sort of business manager, whatever. And he asked her, what, well, what do you do? And she explained her background. And then she, he said, no, what do you do? And then she explained her title. And he's like, no, what do you actually do? And I think that's an interesting thing because so many corporations, most people don't really do anything. <laughs> and I think when you force people to actually think about what they're doing to drive forward the vision of the company, that changes the company, that improves the team. So in Cheryl's case, um, she was a, a true polymath when she was at Treasury and we hired her without a portfolio and I hired her. Um, and. I figured it'd be useful to have such a smart person around. And so she wandered around looking at financing options and so forth. And then after working with Bill, she and Bill and Omid, who was running sales at the time, came upon the idea of creating an indirect sales force. Essentially people who would not call on customers, but would react to customers. That ultimately became two thirds of our revenue, many, many thousands of people, and propelled her into the career where she's now done this fantastic job at Facebook doing similar things. So it shows you that sometimes getting the right person and then figuring out what they what position they can play is a good approach. And he worked hard on that. Right, and it's, and it's a two-step process, Absolutely. right? So it's finding, obviously she was a genius. Yeah, I mean, obviously, one of the most successful people in Silicon Valley right now. And, but operationally, she still had to take that next step, which he kind of pushed her into. Why do you think you didn't push her into that? It took Bill's uh, push to do it. I think he was just better at it. Mm. You know, at first I was busy dealing with, with Larry and Sergey and other things, but also having someone on the team who is focused on the career development and impact of each person is a tremendous asset if you're CEO, because otherwise you're doing that too. And we got to the point where Bill would do compensation issues, he would manage the board for me, he would help with hiring and so forth. And and whenever and in ever in all of these high high intensity places, there's always one executive who's out of favor at any given time, and it rotates around. And so I would say to Bill, go fix that. And Bill would say, I'm busy fixing the last error that you made, Eric. And I said, okay, well, go fix that one next. Can you right. can you give an example? Better not about to. the last error. Be, be, better not to name names. Ugh, Eric, you gotta okay, don't name names, but you can give me like a more specifics. Of, uh, <laughs> There was an executive who said X, well, and I didn't like it. <laughs> there, there are often situations where people, people's egos and need for power and need for identity get ahead of things. Now, a normal person might say, hey, these guys are spoiled, they make lots of money, they have these powerful jobs, what are they complaining about? Well, nevertheless, they do, right? In the same sense that, that star players do. And so a typical example would be so-and-so is annoyed that this person is doing something over here, they think they're wrong and they think they, they could do that job better. And my answer is go back and do your own job better. In other words, go back and play your own position. And Bill was much more artful. So like in, in what way would he, and, and that you refer to this as kind of understanding the gaps in communication between people, in what way would you see him kind of, because you see this in corporations all the time, there's turf battles yeah. everywhere. How would he resolve some of these issues? The technique that he, that he liked the most was to make the two people work on a joint project, which is inevitably painful for both. But first, this would produce interesting outcomes because they're both intelligent people. 
Uh, and second, it would make the technology, it would make the transition much easier. We got to the point where things were going so well that people would actually hand budgets involving thousands of people to each other and just give them up because it was the right thing. Normally in companies, people fight for control over money and power and size of organization and buildings. We didn't have any of that because of this model. That's a bill model. You know, it's interesting because it parallels also the advice Bill gave you in 2004 when you were debating quitting Google. You know, here you were making this money, but you're you're and doing well, but your your ego was getting in the way, and he kind of used that same technique to. And, and and what I like about that story, aside from the fact that he he did the right thing and I was about to do the wrong thing, is he was coaching for the team, right? I was a member of the team. I was I was out of position. You know, I was doing the wrong thing. I was my ego was getting out of way, and he he said in a nice way, I can get you what you need, right? And he got it. And do you have a sense of how often he coached, let's say, Larry and Sergey, in terms of them dealing with not quite managerial control, but it was still their company? Well, again, he, he was doing, I shouldn't speak for them, but they, he was working with them. And indeed, when I stopped being CEO and Larry became CEO, uh, again, for the second time, Bill was his coach until Bill's death. Right, so and Bill met with Larry as CEO weekly as he did with me, and he attended Larry's staff meetings as he did with me. Hmm. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports? is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model 
for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. So Bill was pretty busy. Like he was doing this for Steve Jobs over Absolutely. at Apple. And I imagine dealing with Steve Jobs every day with all the Apple stuff and then all the Google stuff and then everyone else. And he was on the board of Apple yes. as well. And so that, that maybe because And of his... by the way, they put me on the board of Apple till they kick me off. Right. And 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 so I wanted to ask about that. And there there's there's an interesting um scene in Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs where I think you were sitting at a cafe and and you're talking on the phone with Steve Jobs or Steve Jobs is 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 having coffee with you and basically yelling at you about you know the Android took this and took that uh, and meanwhile you were on the board of Apple Bill's advising both of you it, it almost sounds a little incestuous but how do you how do you kind of resolve these things while a keeping emotions down and b uh, keeping all the legal aspects down. Well, the way we really involved it is we just asked Coach Bill to fix it. And what <laughs> did he how, do? Well, in because so that wasn't mentioned in Walter Isaacson's no, book. No. Um, so uh, Steve and I had uh, lunch often, and we had lunch at Cal Calafia, which was the restaurant founded by the former Google chef, which was near Steve's house in Palo Alto. And for the first half of it, the lunch was about his medical situation, his family, and so forth, very personal things. And the second half of his lunch was him yelling at me over Android. <laughs> and uh, and I, at the time, I didn't know whether we would end up in conflict or not. Um, and so I, what I remember was, and of course, we're, we're very close friends, and we left. And then I called our lawyer as I was leaving on the cell phone in the car and said, we've got a problem. We've got to re resolve this. We then, working with Bill, I said, Bill, what do we do? And Bill said, why don't we have somebody who's not you, Eric, and not Larry and Sergey, work with Steve and the Apple team. We chose a guy named Alan Eustace, who was running engineering, was in charge of everything, super competent. And Alan dealt with Steve, and Steve would call and yell at Alan, and Al would say, we'll change this, we won't change that. And that's how he resolved it. Um, ultimately, I was the correct thing for me to do was to get off the board for many good business reasons, and so Steve and I agreed to do that. But the important point is that's a good example where Bill's knowledge of both companies really helped and his credibility with both companies. And so looking at Bill's background, you know, he was the CEO of, of Intuit, and there was one uh, uh, situation you described there where a product manager um, getting customer feedback reeled off a list of features he wanted from the developers. And Bill said, don't do that. Tell the developers the customer problem and let them come up with the features. 
And I thought that was interesting because is that really always how it should be? Because wouldn't the product manager who is interfacing with the customer have a better sense of what features should be in there? Um, usually, if you ask customers what they need, they'll give you very specific and helpful and very narrow feedback. The way to build great products is to imagine and get right what the customer really wanted as opposed to what they're using now. And that's a, what that's, it was another lesson from Bill, and I think it's true in technology. We're in the business of inventing new products that are even more effective. Uh, that's why the product cycles happen so quickly. That's why the products are so effective. But it's a different from go and inventory all the comments from your customer and then do exactly what they say. And that's what Bill was talking about. And, and you know, at that point, I guess around then, he started to phase out of into it, go into coaching. What do you think he was thinking would be his role in life post you know, his, his managerial career? Did he see himself as this basically the CEO of Silicon Valley in some weird way, the, the coach of Silicon Valley? I think we now know that he did this 16 hours a day. He didn't sleep very much. He coached the, little, the um, high school team. He hung out with his sports friends. He was very involved in youth movement and sports. In addition to that, he coached at least 20 companies in the way that I'm describing, not just Apple and Google. Um, so he had enormous reach, clearly what he wanted to do. And then, you know, of course, you were at, you, you were at Google 18 years, a long time to be at one company. Uh, you know, you built that from, I don't know what the revenues were of anything in 2001, and then, you know, by the end, it's 100 billion in revenues. Uh, with most of that being on the advertising side, and then the profits being used for, for these moonshots. And I think... Bill, you say in the book, is very, very much in favor of uh, reinvesting profits in innovation. Was that was he involved in kind of the idea of let's look at moonshot possibilities? And he was, although the founders really drove that. Mm -hmm. So the history on the moonshots and moonshots are um, the, the idea is to do something like John F. Kennedy and going to the moon. You know, take a, an audacious goal and really fund it. So Larry and Sergey uh, created a group called Google X, now called X which was a sort of innovation in, in engine to do completely different things. The first thing that Google X did was create what is something which is now known as Google Brain, which is the AI system that Google uses. The, the, since that system is used in all of Google's revenue and all of Google search today, you can say that Google X was a success from day one, right? that its impact is incalculably high. And then, of course, there's the self-driving car. Self-driving car and our medical work and so forth. The deep mind. The there's a group here called Sidewalk Labs in New York, which is working on new new forms of urbanization and so forth. You know, I I, I guess it was a couple of years ago you wrote what you think are going to be the the next six biggest tech innovations, and I was surprised to see uh, plant based. I think everyone was surprised to see plant based foods was your number one biggest innovation. I, you know, everybody else could have thought AI or virtual, you, and you mentioned, you know, 3D printing with, with architecture, virtual reality. You mentioned all the, the stuff that people expected, but then plant-based foods, number one. Mm -hmm. Are you a vegan? No, uh, maybe I should be, mm -hmm. but um, it just seems like um, most of the, um, so if you go back to the history here, most of the world's surface is, that's arable is useful now for farming, used for farming. And that we're going to be much, much better off with much more uh, mechanized versions of natural substances um, to plant-based foods to one kind or another. And I think we'll also be able to grow, uh, for example, synthetic meat um, from natural um, organisms that are in meat to avoid sort of the cow problem. And you sit there and go like, what's the problem with cows? Don't you like cows? I actually like cows, but they contribute a great deal to global warming. So we have to really think at human scale about the impact we're having on the planet. So plant-based foods, uh, all of the kinds of things that are happening in tech now are important for the salvation of our species. And are these things that you, like, I'm, I'm curious just what other issues you discussed with Bill other than kind of operational or managerial issues. Did he kind of have this big picture view of, of the planet and, and technology and so on? Did you ever discuss strategy, uh, bigger picture stuff with him? 
Um, Bill was mostly a person about people and not strategy. Bill's sort of view was that you would organize the people and then the strategy and the tactics and the products would come out of it. So he was a people first person. What I realize now at the age I am, that that is the right answer for me too, right? That I'm not going to compete at the technical level anymore. I'm just not current enough. But I have better judgment about people. And now I understand what his gift was. He had done it enough that he could help organize people. And that's, I think, the calling for people at a certain age in our industry. Do you see yourself potentially, I mean, I'm sure you probably are to some extent, but do you see yourself being more active as a coach in Silicon Valley? Uh, I'm trying. It's much harder than it sounds, um, although the, the rules, and we actually published an open playbook, including a slide share and so forth, to tell you these rules. But it's, it's hard to apply them. It really is an art. So I don't think I'll ever be as good as Bill, but I'm trying. Do you think it's because you've been so much in the trenches battling in Silicon Valley, it's hard to say all of a sudden, hey, now I'm it's, independent. It's, it's and hard. And one of the things that happens as you get older is that there is a reality of, of aging, right? I can do math as well as anybody else can. Um, and you only have so many years left. How do you want to spend them? It turns out a good answer is serving humanity, right? And he did that. Yeah, it's, again, it's the, um, if, if you've been blessed, be a blessing quote. Uh, so, you know, you mentioned in the book that one of the companies he advised was Amazon, but I don't, you didn't have any examples really that I could find. Uh, uh, where, where did you see him advising Amazon? He was called in um, early by the Amazon board to evaluate how the CEO was doing. And there was a I guess a concern about the CEO. And Bill came back after spending some time in Seattle saying, the CEO has huge potential. And of course, that CEO is Jeff Bezos. How did he determine that? He just knew. So, so he looked for four qualities, it seems, when, when he was helping you with hiring. One was intelligence, the other is work ethic, the other is integrity. The fourth was uh, this concept of, of grit. Well, also coachability. Mm -hmm. um, Jonathan, can you take a minute and, and tell, tell how you first met Bill? Sure, that was a good lesson on coachability. I was actually coming to Eric to collect what I thought was my Google job offer, and there weren't any hurdles left, and I was sat down by his assistant, Pam, in a big conference room, and this guy saunters in, some old guy, I've never seen him before, and he just sits down, says, yeah, Rosenberg, I spoke to people in the Valley about you. You're smart, you work hard, don't care. Got just one question. You coachable. Depends on the quality of the coach. And he responds, smart Alex are not coachable. And he gets up and leaves. And I'm like, what was that? That's that coach that Eric has, that guy that knows Steve Jobs. My Google job offer just disappeared into the micro kitchen. So I ran out to get him. And he goes, Rosenberg, back in there, button chair. And I go sit down and wait. And he comes back and he gives me a lecture on humility and coachability. And then he asks, okay, I have one more question. If I were to be your coach, what would you want to get out of it? And like, I didn't, I was like, Eric, I didn't really want a coach. I didn't need a coach, but I did need an answer to this question. And that's when I came back with the Tom Landry quote about him, a coach being a person who could see what you didn't see and hear what you didn't hear. And he looked at me like skeptical that I really meant it. Repeat, repeat the quote so everybody hears it again. Uh, so a coach can see the things that you can't see and hear the things you don't want to hear so that you can be the person you always wanted to be. So working with, working with Bill in the years following that, what did, what did he see that you couldn't see? Well, I think he saw that I was at a point in my life where he would say to me at one point about three years later, Jonathan... It's what you learn after you know it all that counts, which was a John Wooden quote. And I think what he realized was that at that point in my life at age 41, I did think I knew it all. But after the next two or three years working with Bill, I learned then that I didn't know it all. And that was actually when my career with him took off and where my learning really started. But isn't it true that everybody we know who's about 40 in the tech industry who's running these things, in all the different groups, they think they know it all. They do. They've had lots of experience. They're well compensated. They've got lots of attention. What more is there to know? And yet you have the John Wooden quote. Yeah. And, and, and what, was, what was something that you realized later on that you thought you knew, where you thought you knew it all, 
that Bill was able to kind of subtly point out or ask questions to you where you realize, oh, I need to be more curious about this. I mean, just the basics of management, running staff meetings. Uh, Bill taught me that running staff meetings, starting them with trip reports to get people on the same, uh, to get people sort of to come out and get their guard down and, and, and share something that they had done, but even more fundamentally, running one-on-ones. Bill would start his one-on-one with me by asking me, what are the five things you want to talk about? And in his pocket, he had the five things he wanted to talk about. If they were the same, for this week, Jonathan's priorities were straight. If they were different, he straightened out my priorities. And each time, he would go back to the things that were the most important. Your performance against your objectives, your relationship with your peers, that's the other people on the team, what you're doing to innovate, and how you were doing on your management practices. So he had a model that kept you focused on your priorities that had the most important things reviewed each week. I didn't do that. I like showed up for my one-on-ones with people asking them what they wanted to talk about. I didn't prepare for my one-on-ones with my people and I called myself a good manager. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of the discussion of management in the book seems to be about managing the team that works for you. But what about managing upwards? So for instance, there's many times that employees and corporations might think they know it all, for instance. And maybe they do. Maybe in some cases they do more, know more than the CEO about something or something that they're close to that they're working on, like Bill did with the, with the commercial at Apple versus the board. How did he advise employees working for you to manage upwards when dealing with you when you might have been wrong about something? Alan, well, it, can we bring you in? Sure. This? You have a mic. When you talk to everybody, what did people tell you? Well, first of all, writing this book with Eric and Jonathan was an exercise in managing up for me. Um, so I can't say what I really learned from that. But you know, one of the things that uh, Bill would really stress in relationships is not so much managing up or managing down, but managing peer relationships. And one of the measures of your success and how you can do well in a company is how well you get along with your peers and what they think of you. So that was, that was one insight. Um, and, and these are principles you know, we're, we're talking a lot about Bill here, but these are really principles that any of us can apply. Uh, how do you think about your peer relationships? How, how do you coach your team instead of just managing your team? So one of the things that came through in all of our interviews was that the, we interviewed over 80 people and almost all of them have used what they learned from Bill to become better coaches of their own teams. Well, uh, and but, but, but Alan, you in your interviews, there was one theme that came out, which was the theme of, of love. Oh, well, yes. Um, probably the word we heard most often with all the people that we interviewed was love. They loved Bill, Bill loved them, and they learned that it's okay to bring love into the workplace. And of course, this is an entirely appropriate, chaste kind of love, but it's not a word you ever hear uh, spoken about in the workplace. And yet, you know, Bill deeply cared about people, and he, I think he taught all of us that to be a better manager and to be a better leader, you really need to love people. But you, it, and that translates today into talking to people about their challenges. Everybody now has so much pressure on them, right? In between attention coming in, criticism, everyone's unhappy, so forth and so on. Talking to them as a human being about their internal travails is a key component of leadership. And, it, and again, this is not taught at all. And you, you talked know, about taking you know, those five minutes uh, Sundar Pashai, the Google CEO, called it the lovely reset. Take a few minutes and talk to people like humans. You know, bring humanity into the conversation even in the workplace. You know, and I think we all can listen to that and, and agree, okay, when times are good, we can all agree that's a good idea. And when times are good, it's easier to follow than when times are bad. And there's a great story in the book uh, when Ben Horowitz was running LoudCloud and potentially had to do some you know, employee changes or layoffs rather than do the big event in New York City with, with Loud Cloud announcing this deal, he had to go, you know, Bill encouraged him to be with the employees, give them bad news directly, be there emotionally for them, and how important that was to build trust, I guess, with the remaining team that was there to show that, that Ben was part of their team. Uh, but, you know, it also reminds me, when you say, um, you know, love was mentioned frequently, just based on your stories also, it seems like, and based on Jonathan's uh, story, uh, it seems Bill was very much about people being curious about themselves. So he wasn't going to go in and say, 
do this, do this, do this. Although that did happen sometimes in some of your stories. Seems like more he was driven by questions. What are your priorities for this meeting? Are you coachable? What, when are you going to quit? You're much better off if you're asking questions rather than telling people what to do. Because if you ask somebody a question, they're then engaged in your thought process. They're gonna to try to figure out why you asked the question and they'll modify their behavior. When you're yelling at an employee to do something, you are losing, right? That is a bad situation. And that's what we learned from Bill. And did you ever find yourself during these 18 years uh, at Google yelling at someone and thinking to your, in your head, ugh, Bill is not gonna like this, but I feel like I have to do it? I, I made that mistake and many, many others. Um, and a typical example would be, um, I would get so upset, for example, about something and I would push, 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 push. And then he, Bill would come back and say, you were right on what you said, but your mechanism was terrible, right? You're not gonna get what you wanted. So you made your point, now what? So, so now you've, you're out of Google, you're out of your operational role of any of these companies. Where do you see, you know, use, with, with Bill still almost as this, you know, he was your coach and mentor for so long, where do you see yourself now uh, for the next 30 years? Of, of your life? Well, for, for me personally, I think uh, there's an age at which reality sets in. For me, it was 60. And for people who are below 60, people say, well, when, you actually, when your birthday is just a number, well, it is a number, but it has a lot of implications for you because you begin to do the math and friends of yours begin to get ill and so forth. So, and this is a human condition. So in my case, what I've decided to do is to spend my time on basically philanthropic efforts around talent and talent development of one kind or another, as well as improving the state of science in our country. Um, one of the things to remember is that the economic growth that we see all around us is essentially a result of technology investment, scientific investment over 100 years. So a commitment to education and to investing in science is where I'm going to spend my time. Do you think, uh, it's just an offbeat question, but do you think lifespans will, will grow based on research and innovation happening now? Uh, over the next 30, 40 years? They will. Um, lifespan, human lifespan has been increasing about um, some number of months per, per decade. And so a reasonable presumption is a child born today can live to 100 on average. Um, and again, that's 100 years from now, so that's a long time. And many of the gains that have occurred in the last 100 years have been through simple life extension of better sanitation, better food, Globalization has produced an enormous increase in human lifespan and quality of life from destitute people in the developing world to people who are, from their perspective, in a lower, a lower middle income quality of life. They have enough to send their kids to school and begin to build the dream of the middle class in their countries. So globalization has a huge positive effect on that. Two billion people lifted out of poverty. The combination of that plus connectivity will really su supercharge the, the globe going forward. And the number one thing is healthcare. And we in the developed world forget that the majority of people in the world do not have access to modern hospitals, modern banking. My friend Jared and I were in Myanmar on Inlay Lake with a guide. And I said, I don't see any hospitals. And she goes, hospitals? And I said, well, do you guys get sick? I mean, I, I, I honestly was so stupid, I asked the question that way, and she said, of course we do. And I said, well, what happens when people get sick? He said, they leave. And I didn't understand the, the translation, and then what I, that actually meant they left the village and they didn't return because they died, hmm. right? They, and they died in the woods or what have you. We, we forget how tragic this is, and these are, in many, many cases, um, things that we know how to fix. So. Before we decry the progress we've made, let's recognize that the human condition today is such that the average person worldwide is highly likely to live their full and natural age for their society, which is in their typically 70s now, which is amazing, right? And that's, a, that's the result of an awful lot of people working very hard for this purpose. I want us using technology to get farther. Typical example is that mobile phones are a huge boon to healthcare because people, remember, don't have access to health information. 
I was in Kenya with my friend who's a computer science professor, and he said, we love Google. I said, well, everyone loves Google. And um, he said, no, I really love Google. I said, well, I really love Google too. And I go, why do you really love Google? I said, we use it as a textbook. And I said, how do you use Google as a textbook? And he said, we don't have textbooks. And I said, this is a computer science graduate program. Right? So think about it. Right? Online, you're te teaching the top people in the society, and you don't have textbooks even for them. Right? That's the power of the online world. Apply that to medicine, apply that to science, apply that to the smart people. Um, another interesting statistic is that uh, if you look at the UN reports, Africa is roughly 15% of human population. And by the year 2100, um, it'll be roughly 41%. So we have a, not only an opportunity, but a responsibility to get these technologies and to get our innovations, especially for low-cost innovations, to this burgeoning population growth in areas which are not particularly well-governed and not particularly wealthy. We've got it pretty good. We need to help them out. And so Bill Gates is doing a lot, of course, with his charity. Do you guys ever all get together in secret enclaves and say, look, we're going to do this now to save this country and... Is there like billionaire um, phone conference calls? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint you, but no. Um, there are indications that there, there, there's a set of like-minded philanthropists, including myself, who are trying to pool money around certain causes, um, but it's still not very well managed. And I think because of the wealth that's been created, especially in tech, you're going to see a great deal more of this. If you look, for example, Zuckerberg did this huge um, healthcare genetics program. That's a really special program. Uh, other people from Facebook have done have done very special things in health, and I think you're going to see more. Well, Eric Schmidt, and of course we're joined by Jonathan Rosenberg and Alan Eagle, your co-authors on this trillion dollar coach, the story of Bill Campbell and how he coached Apple, Amazon, Google, and so many companies to trillions of dollars of, of value. You wrote other books, uh, How Google Works, the first book, The New Digital Age. I am so grateful you came on the podcast and also your, your co-authors joined us. And, and uh, uh, I, I, how, what questions didn't I ask? How could I have been better? <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, that's a Bill Campbell question. Uh, and the answer is you did a perfect job. Oh, no, that's a, that's a bad answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Big round of applause for our two guests today. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.